everyone, and welcome to Book Break. Today, my guest is my fellow librarian, Lisa, and we are just going to kind of talk about an eclectic mix today of what we've been reading lately. I feel like I've been reading like a lot of three-star reads, kind of, but, but there have been a few that have stood out. Well, I weeded out a couple. I, tr I started some I was really excited about, and then I... There was one I really wanted to read. I got it from another library. Well, actually, you put it on hold for me. I was so disappointed in it. And yeah. I, I, I th I'm just happy that I did not go on Amazon and buy it. Yeah. Because I was going to. Sometimes um, that happens. And, and, and then I started another one, and I, I thought, well, I don't like how it's reading, so I'll try it on Audible. I did not like it there. And so I just gave up, and I went back to a couple that I knew were solid reads. Okay. And I really enjoyed them. Tried and true. Yeah. All right. Well, the first one I'm going to talk about, I thought of you a little bit when I read this one, and it's called The Antique Hunter's Guide to Murder by C.L. Miller. It's a debut novel mm -hmm. published February of this year, so I'm a little late to the party, but a couple other of our coworkers have read this. Yeah, I actually purchased that one for my mother, and, um, I, and she I, really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, I thought about you because you're like the antique. Yeah. You know, I know that's that's, that's one, of the one of the books of my passion. List. So yep, antiques are definitely my passion. So it was an interesting backstory about this one too, because readers learn early on that this book was written by in consultation with an international antiques expert. Her mm. name was Judith Miller. She passed away in 2023, but she was a specialist. Part of the Miller Antiques family? Yeah, okay. she was a specialist yeah. on BBC's Antiques Roadshow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and this was her daughter. And she oh. also wrote a book called The Miller's Antique Price Guide, which I don't know if we have in this country or if it's just in um, England. That's a very popular um, guide. My mother has many um, editions of that on her shelf. For, okay. She uses for um, when she has to look things up. So, so anyway, her daughter, C.L. Miller, decided to follow her long-held dream of becoming an author and concentrating on her writing. So um, this was her first novel. And she does incorporate a lot of the antiques into it, which makes it really fun. Yeah. So the main character is Freya Lockwood. And she is shocked when she learns that her mentor, author Crockleford, <laughs> antiques dealer, yeah. um, and he's been, they've been estranged. He's died under mysterious circumstances. And, of course, she's been summoned back to her hometown okay. after his death because he's left her something in his will. Um, her um, guardian was a, her aunt, and her aunt had sort of a relationship, you know, with author. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether it was romantic, they were just good friends, but definitely a relationship. So anyway, Freya has no choice but to go back to this hometown and this um, store and everything that she swore to leave behind. So joining forces with her eccentric Aunt Carol... <laughs> they were given like a letter with all these kind of mysterious mm -hmm. clues in it. So they search the antique store. They realize certain things were out of place, and there's certain things that they were looking for. But anyway, Freya was taking his place at this country estate where author was supposed to like value and declare the value of all these antiques. Oh, okay. Well, once she gets her, she realizes a lot of them are reproductions uh -oh. and not very good reproductions oh, at boy. that. And of course, there's people there, you know, things start happening to them. So they realize, you know, they're in trouble, too. So it's a, a typical, not typical, but uh, a cozy mystery kind of format, you know. So would it spoil it by saying what she was left in the will? Well, she got a letter. Oh, the letter. Yeah. But... That was and the it. store. And oh, his I, store. I was going to say, of course she would inherit the store. Yes, of course. So, and of course she doesn't want it, right? Right. And she oh. is in the middle of a divorce um, from her husband, who is, of course, moved on to a new relationship. Her mm -hmm. daughter is now, I think she just started college in the United States. They're in England. So she's kind of looking mm -hmm. for something to fill her life. I won't tell you what she does with the store or anything else, but okay. it, it was a it was a good read. I okay. liked it. It was I'm entertaining. Gonna to, I'm going to have to check that one out. I so, know my mom has still has it, so I can just yeah. Each copy. chapter starts with a quote from author. I love that. And um, 
one of them was sooner or later we all leave this earth what matters is the story we've left behind so i kind of like that one yeah i like that too yeah so it's not too gruesome it's kind of fun entertaining yeah. um yeah, The Antique Hunter's Guide nice. to Murder. And the way it was written, I think they might be setting it up for, she might be onto a series. Oh, okay, So great. hopefully there'll be more to oh, read. Maybe they'll turn it into a, like a Netflix thing too. Well, my first book is really heavy. Um, actually, Molly um, talked about it on one of her book talks on Monday night, and it sounded really interesting. It's, it's a, a historical fiction, and I really enjoy reading about different cultures, and this one's set in China, and it's right at the, um, when the... Um. All right. Revolution. Yeah, when the when the communists were taking over China. Oh all yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mao Zedong. The Chinese communist yes. revolution. So it's called Daughters of Shandong, and it's by Eve J. Chung. And their quote from there isn't as nice as your quote. Their the, her, the quote from the matriarch of the family was, "Daughters are the Ang family's curse." So oh. her son is married to her to. Married to the to the mom, and they never really give her a name, mom. She's just mom, and which kind of goes into showing you her value. Um, so she she constantly is giving birth to daughters. Of course, in those days, they didn't realize that it's the ma- male that determines the sex of the children, but they didn't know that back then. So she's very has a low status because she hasn't given them a son or an heir. She is basically the person who. They, they just use her as a slave. She cooks, she cleans. That's her status in the, in the family. And they're very wealthy. They live in this town of Shandong, China. And they have this beautiful home that is, has a gate around it, a wall. But she has, she has an affinity for all the workers. She sneaks them food. When there's a young girl that's sick, she sneaks her medicine. So the workers, they all adore her. And she cooks and makes sure everybody's fed. Now, Hai is the eldest daughter, and she, she's the one who really watches out for the sisters. They have a younger um, daughter, and she's the youngest right now. Her name is Dee, and she was, and it means brother. They gave it to her in mockery, because after when Dee was born, they didn't even want to bother really naming the girls, because, oh, you know, that's, they weren't valued. Um, she's very headstrong, Dee. She's a year younger, and she knows how to hide in plain sight. So she's kind of like a chameleon. Um, she can adapt to all the situations, which really helps her out as they move along here with all the terrible hardships they have to go through. And then she has three, and three is never given a name. They just call her the third daughter, and then Lilan is the fourth daughter. Um, they didn't know that she was pregnant with Lilan when this all happened. So basically the family has to flee because the communists are coming, and they're going to punish this family. So guess what? They leave the girls and the mother behind to fend for themselves. Yeah. Oh, isn't that nice? Isn't that lovely? So basically, um, they they're, well, they're, another quote is, girls are nothing more than wives for other people's sons. So the Nene is the matriarch of the family. She's just a horrible woman. She, she basically wanted to... She wanted her feet to be bound because it was part of the culture, and she so she her feet are bound. She wanted to bind mom's feet. She did bind her feet, but she ended up taking her bindings off. So now poor mom has a problem walking. She walks a little limp. So they try to stay in their home as long as they can, but they the workers know that this is not going to be good for them. They tell them, you've got to get out of here. Grab what you can, and let's go. One of the farmers hides them at their farm, and they stay with them as long as they can. They, they actually live in the chicken coop. Oh, my gosh. So um, while they're in the chicken coop hiding from the trying – to, trying to stay under the radar of the communists, they actually take um, High and they punish her. They beat her almost to death, and High, High witnesses the neighbors being murdered because they're trying to find out where, where, High, where Nene and the father have fled to. Okay. Now – now they have to flee the communists, and the, there's this one whole little under the dog. His, they call him Lucky. Lucky is the highlight and the light of um, High's life. She, um, because every time Lucky's around, he will bark and warn them if there's anybody in the area, and that's what keeps them safe for a long time. So when they go to leave, they say they bid farewell to the farmer, and they they take off. They have to get out of there under the cover of night. Um, Lucky follows them, and he stays with them throughout their journey. And it's this whole journey. They're trying to get to Hong Kong. So they finally, they go to a town. 
Lucky the dog keeps following to protect them. And the whole time I'm like, please don't let anything happen to Lucky. Please <laughs> don't know. let anything ha- happen to Lucky. It's so funny how you get so attached to these these animals and books right, or movies. Yeah. And you don't want anything to happen to them. And if something does, you're like, that's it. I'm, or at least I feel that way. So they they flee to another town and in Kwandu. And, and they find out they have an uncle which is a miracle. And they end up living with this uncle. And the poor old man has TB. So they help him. They take care of him. They live there. They beg. Um, they, you know, they have to beg to survive. And then they flee to, um, they finally get into Hong Kong. They have to leave there. And in Hong Kong, they're put into this area to live where, they, where all the um, immigrants and all the people that are migrating from all different parts of China have to live. Um, and they're all doing the same thing. They're just trying to survive. Well, ironically, um, Nene and her, uh, or not Nene, that's the gr- grandmother, Hi, and her sister D are out begging one day, and they get caught by a police officer who brings them to the um, to the pol- to the station and it turns out that he's related to them through he knows different families and he takes care of them and helps them and he helps secure them which is a very difficult thing to do a, a ticket they finally get to um taiwan after this harrowing journey and they have to leave the poor dog behind which is heartbreaking and the saddest part is when the train's going down the track the dog's chasing the train and you're like oh god oh, so anyways, they finally get to where um, the family is. Family. Meanwhile, Nene has been trying to get the father to marry someone else because she's still looking for a, you know, an a heir. Yeah. Um, they finally get there. She treats them like cattle. She puts them in the courtyard. She won't let them in the house till they're hosed down. And the file, their father finally stands up and, and um, takes them away. And, it, it, you know, I mean, it's... It works out in the end, but it just the way that these poor women are treated through this whole whole saga just goes to show you how women were just what they went through in China. Right. They were not valued. We all know that, like the whole that whole era where all those little girls were in the when baby girls were put into those foster horrible homes because they didn't want them or they killed them because they only wanted boys. Yep. So it's it's just what they had to go through to get. To get to um, back to home to a home really that didn't even want them that was the worst part, and the whole time this second sister the one that was chameleon like didn't want to find her family she's like why are we trying to find these people right they didn't want us yeah but mom was so traditional she she wanted to be back with her family because the family bonds were so strong but it's, I think it's, I would have said. I see know I would have been like, see ya, I'll start my own life here. Mm. So it was a really good story, and I learned a lot about what happened during the time of that takeover by the communists yeah. and um, the way that they were treated. Um, it was it was really good. Hmm. The strength of, the, of women. Okay. The strength of women was really good. Well, I'm going to go in a totally different direction. Um, yeah. I I've, know I've oh, talked really about other books in this series before, this one was called The Secret Hours by Mick Heron, and I listened to the audiobook. It was published in September of 2023, Goodreads rating of 4.28, over 13,000 ratings, and I gave it a four. Um, this is a prequel, or kind of standalone, featuring the characters in Slough House, which is a TV show on Apple Plus. It's actually called Slow Horses. <laughs> oh, I love that show. Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. It, it's like one of my favorite yeah. shows on TV. Gary um, Oldman's one of my favorite actors. I yeah, love him. Gary Oldman is awesome. He's the main character, Jackson Lamb. Mm-hmm. So in this story, or this it, book, you learn about what happened to Jackson Lamb when he was in Berlin okay. um, many years ago. And it kind of gives you a very good backstory into the characters and how they moved forward. Ah, so, and it also reveals another character that I won't name because it was a surprise for me when I found out who it was, but it was someone, you know, you see in the show and oh, okay. know who that is. So the narrator does a fantastic job with the accents and characters. I believe the narrator's name is Gerald Doyle. Doyle. So the way the story goes here, two years ago, the prime minister in England launched a special monochrome 
inquiry, which is investigating wrongdoing, essentially, by the British Secret Service. So, yes. Yes. So Monochrome's mission was to ferret out any hint of misconduct by any MI5 oh, agent. Yeah. Jeez. So, That's not a um, light undertaking. Jeez. Definitely <laughs> not. Have... And there's a lot to go around. So it it's a always a, on this health. show. Do you watch this one, Sean? No, but <clears throat> I've seen the previews, and I've always liked Gary Oldman. Mm -hmm. and I, I love like, him. Oh, what am I doing now? Talk this. about a chameleon. He it's can do seriously. anything, that guy. Yeah. But, uh, I love the setup already. Yes. You know, um, corruption, uh, MI5, I'm in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Gary Oldman's job in this series is he is kind of, He's a fantastic spy, but he is the leader of the House of Spy Misfits. So if you, <laughs> I got to be careful, screw up yeah. in the mm -hmm. other parts of somehow in your career or you've, somebody has wants to do you dirty, mm -hmm. you are sent to Slough House. So if, you, if yep. you jeopardize the crown in the least through it's the... not even the crown. Yeah. It's, it's all the political... Oh inner yeah. workings oh. of the MI5. Yeah. I'm into it. You yeah. Get somebody wrong <laughs> the wrong way you're sent to Slough House. Right. So um so MI's formidable first desk, she did not become Britain's top spy by accident and she has successfully thwarted this inquiry at every turn because there's always the danger when you start investigating these wrongdoings mm -hmm. that you're going to uncover something a that close somebody to, else yeah. really didn't want uncovered. Mm -hmm. But um, what happens is somebody is in the grocery store and gets banged, and this mysterious letter package goes into it. When they open it up, it's a secret MI5 file. Mm. So they go to this monochrome inquiry board, and it starts this mm -hmm. process of looking into something that happened in Berlin Probably when the curtain came, you know, the Iron Curtain came down. So like the early 90s? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, when does this take place? This takes place, I'm thinking now, but yeah. the the inquiry was a classified operation in 1994, Berlin. Gotcha. Um, so it ended in tragedy and scandal, and the cover-up cover has rewritten 30 years of service history. So... I thought it took me a while to get into this one because it starts out where someone is being chased mm. and you really don't know who it is. It's not a character you're familiar with. So I'm like, why, sh why should I know this person? And why is like this team of assassins, you know, he's like, like an like, old professor or something why am in I the getting English countryside. In but you know, yeah. okay, he can't be, yeah. you know, if, if all of these like ninjas are They're coming so after him. Yeah. MI5 is like our FBI, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. Because I know from the Bond movies and the Ian Fleming, the MI6 is like their CIA. They do yeah. international, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That I get that's so confusing. Oh, I know. But I, I if you like that kind of stuff, like mm. I don't even normally read like I read some thrillers and mysteries. I don't normally do spy stuff, but this one is yeah, just Yeah, that's so not my good. kind of thing either, but once I started watching Slow Horses and then I went, "Oh, what's the book?" and then I, you know, I started yeah. getting into it. Then I really got into that. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah, you I think you'd really like it. Yeah. So this one is is kind of part of the same History, like you learn a lot about um, Jackson Lamb and what happened into where he, why he was put in the position that he was. So, what yeah. turned you on to this? I know this is way outside your purview for the most part. The he, show, or? was it the show? The show, yeah. and um, someone actually recommended this series oh, okay. to me, and I was just like, eh, I'll try because I like British things. But yeah. when I watched the show, I was like, oh my god. I really yeah. like very it. British. Yeah, I love that this show. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah, and I, yeah, the way they've casted the characters, whoever did casting, has done a fantastic job. Cool. Like I, I said, it's not just Gary Oldham; all the different people are so good. Any British show, I find the characters are so real, and I don't know, they're just amazing. They're not like, well, it's funny too because they kind of have that dark, satirical. Yeah. Which I love, mm -hmm. you know. So if you like that kind of humor, this is going to be right up here. Yeah, and Gary Oldman's character, I, I, 
just kills me the way you know with the drinking and he's he's <laughs> disgusting yeah i mean he, he really is he yeah. has no personal hygiene he just burps in the middle kind of, of everything slob. he's gross yeah. yeah he you know you can just picture he just i'm sure he doesn't smell very well, good <laughs> yeah. you know he's just a mess he's a hot mess he's not a likable character at all cool. really oh i, but uh, yeah. I love him i yeah. mean i don't know why but there's yeah. he just i just do all right. All right. So now, good. I feel good. Like I've yeah. got Sean a yeah. suggestion. Yeah, I so. think you're going to yeah, like that. Either. Yeah. All right, Lisa, what's your next well, one? Well, mine is another uh, historical fiction, but this is a little bit of magical realism. Um, and it's totally different. It's we're, Now we're in Oklahoma, Mendel, Oklahoma, in the 1950s. Okay. And it actually, I forgot to say that my Goodreads review, you know, the rating for Daughters of Shandong was 4.49. Wow, that's really high. And The Seeker Keepers is 4.6. It was really good. It's a second novel by Tricia R. Thomas. Um, and it's it's in Oklahoma, and in the background you have to, I, I went it. I forgot, oh yes, that's where the the Wall Street, Black Wall Street, the race riots took place oh, in like Oklahoma. Oh, like In Tulsa? Yes. Yes, and one of the characters, because one of the characters remembers remembers it as a little being a little child and hiding under the bed while that was all taking place okay um and her dad you know getting out the shotgun and trying to defend his home but anyway so we have daily and she's an african-american seamstress in a very popular store for all the oil barons and their wives it's called the well the wives it's called the regal gown and she is a, just a, it makes beautiful gowns. She has a wonderful reputation. And everyone comes to her for their special occasion dresses and for their wedding dresses. But she also has the gift of sight. So if she touches somebody and she has to have, you know, direct contact with skin to skin. Oh, okay, like she, second sight. You're she talking. has second sight, yeah. and they call it like reading your heartstrings. She can see into what, what's going on. So... She's tried to keep it on the down low. Her her aunt Charlene said, "Do not get involved with white people's business. Mm. Do not get yourself involved." But unfortunately, it, a couple of times when she hasn't had her gloves on, things have happened. So she had one woman that came in and she said, "I know, I know about you." And she's making a little money on the side because she offered her forty dollars, which is a lot of money that then. And tell me, is this my true love? Is this my true love? Who she's going to marry? And when she touches her, she realizes that this woman has been having an um, affair with a Native American gentleman that she's in love with. But uh -oh. of course, you could not be with a Native American gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, and that is her true love. Um, and she says to her, well, you, you know, she lies. She tells her, yes, this is your true love. This is your husband. You're going to, this is the man you're supposed to marry. She doesn't want to tell her. Your dad isn't your true love. Your true love is the man you're having the affair with. Mm -hmm. So now she's like, okay, I'm going to just keep my gloves on from now on because she does not want to be getting involved with these things. Enter Elsa Grimes. She is the daughter of one of the richest men in town. He's struck it rich with oil. He is an oil baron of elite. And she is the most miserable bride she's ever seen coming for a fitting because Elsa does not want to get married. Mm. So Elsa's begging her, please, 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 you know, I, please tell me what my future is. Tell me what my future is. And she, she can't. She puts it off, puts it off, tells her no, 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 doesn't want to get involved with this. Now, Elsa likes to wear boys' clothes. Elsa does not your typical girl. Uh-oh, um, I already know where this is going. And Elsa is in love with the housekeeper's daughter. And it's very sad. Right away, you know, this is not going to end well. Because, you know, it's 1950s. Ingrid is her mother, and her mother just wants her to marry into the next second richest oil family and get rid of her because Ingrid is self-absorbed, and she wants to... Elsa's always held her down, held her back from being her true potential because Elsa has always been an embarrassment to Ingrid because she's not your typical girl that likes to go to parties and dress up. And she's... Ingrid wants found Elsa making out with the aforementioned daughter. Yes. daughter. <laughs> yes. Now, Ingrid is also a very self-centered person, as you can imagine. She wanted to go to the beach one summer, and her husband said, we can't go to the beach. We just had this terrible oil fire, and families are still recovering from it. And she got really mad at him, so she decided to have an affair with the younger son of one of the families, Connor. <laughs> so she's having this passionate affair with Connor. Well, she mentions to Connor at one point that her daughter, she had seen her daughter with um, the maid. Well, it ends, turns, up that, turns out that Connor ends up 
Black forcing male. himself on Ang- on Ingrid's daughter Elsa. Oh. And guess what happens to Elsa? Oh God! No. Now she is pregnant with Connor's son or daughter. Whatever. Seen it a hundred times. It's just these tangled webs we weave, right? <laughs> so, anyways, Bailey does give in to Elsa's demands, and she touches her, and she sees what's going to happen, which I will not say what's going to happen because it will ruin the story. But I don't know if anybody wants to read it. But it is a really interesting story. It has all these horrible things that are going on, but believe it or not, it turns out to have a very satisfying and happy ending. Oh, good. Which is, hmm, I don't know. I think that's where the magical realism comes in more than the touching and the sights, the okay. foresight. Because to me, I really love the story. I loved it, that it had a, an ending like that. But really, is that plausible? Mm-hmm. Could it have come out that wonderful? Probably Could it have not. ended so nicely for everybody? So it was, it was a really good um, story, and it was just interesting to see you know how many lives were destroyed at that time period where people wanted to be with people of other you know of other nationalities and they couldn't no way and or they wanted to just be themselves and they couldn't the right. 50s oh yep. i'm so glad i was never that wasn't when i was born yeah. yeah because so many people how many lives were destroyed because or ended up in a you know sadly because they couldn't be themselves right but yeah it was a really good um it, it sounds like story. it kept you turning the pages. It it was a page turner. Okay. You were invested in these people's lives. Okay. You know, so it was really good. Like the second Elsa, sight thing reminds me of the Green Mile. Oh yeah, the Green and and that was kind of the way she felt it too because yeah. when she would touch she would jolt back mm-hmm. and she would feel this dizzying and her eyes would close. So everyone like that were close to people that were close to Daisy knew when she, when she was getting that second sight yeah. yeah, because she had that reaction. And it also, as the story goes on, her sight, um, it, it evolves. So it's, it, she doesn't, she's able to see things clearer and she doesn't have as much of a, a physical reaction that she does because at first she starts out with a real physical reaction Ooh, gotcha. to it. So and then it becomes more internal and she could just Did see what's Stephen going on. Stephen King write the Green Mile. Okay, yes, yeah, it was that a mini was so se- good. It was a, like a mini series. Okay, every book was like maybe a hundred pages, and he, it was spread out over the course. Of, I want to say at least five or six books. Okay, yeah, yeah. The Green Excellent. Mile was, was really good. Yeah. So that was yeah, I enjoyed that. All right. Well, my next thing is I'm going to start with memoirs. And and it's turned into, I was going to read one, and then now I have a tale of two memoirs. (laughs) Because I, I read, and this is really, I hate when this happens, when you're really looking forward to a certain book. I had Ina Garten's be ready when the luck happens. I've had that on my list, mm-hmm. like I wanted to read. I was the first person. Kind of like the book that I wanted to read, that right. one about the veterinarian that it was. Uh, yeah, on uh, on the Grease know. Holds list. So yeah. when I got it, I was psyched. But um, And I did not know a lot about her backstory, but like most Americans, I'd certainly heard of her, seen her on TV, and I've even used a few of her cookbooks. Mm-hmm. So Sunday, I watched her... She has a new show called Be My Guest because she had my favorite author, Ann Patchett, on it as a guest. And that, too, was like, it was so fast and just the way it was done and everything. And the first question she asked her is, oh, did you not have children, like, as a choice? And I was like, who, who asked that? What? I she know. asked her that? Yeah. And she's like, well, that was my choice. So, oh, you I know. don't. I, well, what if she had had trouble conceiving i mean i, I ask somebody that question no you don't you don't ask oh. somebody and besides that I know, right. if you I'm had read her memoir or from with her yeah not, no pun intended <laughs> or pun intended yeah oh. but um so she describes her childhood as difficult uh the book really kicks off when she meets the love of her life who is jeffrey and she marries him while she's still in college now i know went to syracuse hmm. i think she was a sophomore so she got oh. married pretty young jeffrey meanwhile is at dartmouth um and he had joined like i think he was rotc so he was in the military green beret you know hmm. career military for a while and then he got into other things like he worked for lehman brothers um he was a dean at Yale. And, and this is what kills me is because she kind of acts like they had nothing or whatever. And I'm like, okay. So if you're dean of Yale, 
And you work at Lehman Brothers? <laughs> you, you got money. So what was her family background? Did she come from money? Well, she said not, but her father was a surgeon. How many poor what? surgeons do we know? And how could you go to Syracuse, too? You yeah, know, I, I, mean, I don't right. know, unless you got a full ride. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if she knows what her idea of no money is. Yeah. I mean, maybe she needs Well, that, that was the thing, is, yeah. is, you know, when you talk to, and I'm a, li- you know, a librarian, really. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making Lehman Brothers cash, I'll be honest. But anyway, <laughs> she also flipped houses. She oh. didn't really go into that too much, but I read later on Wikipedia, because I really wanted to look up, like, what was her background? Yeah. Um, and, and so forth. Like, I know they got married young. And they did go backpacking around, like when he had a break in his military service, they went backpacking around France. And they did have like a tent and everything. Well, that's cheap. Yeah. I mean, but still, they had four months off. Yeah. Four months off to go around France. Frolicking about Europe. Frolicking about. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So. I don't know, Ina Garten. I don't know. So anyway. I do like her recipes. But, she yeah. had a uh, like a bureaucratic job. They were both stationed in Washington. I believe she was on President Carter's like nuclear or something team. Like she was a oh a policist or something. I and, did hear about that once. And yes, her so husband that, might have been like in the diplomatic. And again, you don't get these kind of positions without context. I grew up down there. Sorry, but I I digress. So. Anyway, she's she's not happy. She's bored. She realizes she's she likes bored. to entertain. So she said she found a one ad for this store in the Hamptons and decides to buy it. The Barefoot Contessa. Also cheap. Yes. Yeah. Jeez. That's when real estate was going for nothing in the Hamptons, you know? Jeez. <laughs> so she buys uh, the Barefoot Contessa and pretty much... She does sink her whole self into that. Meanwhile, Jeffrey, I believe he starts working for Lehman Brothers. He's in Japan doing all this stuff. But together they make it. Um, They did have a rough patch in their marriage. They really pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. (laughs) I know. I know. I can't stop. Well, that's, see, this is the thing, Sean, is this is is the vibe it gave me. So I had a hard time almost. Kind of rolling your eyes in your head a little bit here and there, I had a hard time kind of finishing the book. And and then at the end of the book, she goes into a whole, like, name-dropping thing. Like, I'm, oh, I was friends with Jennifer Garner, and I cooked with Taylor Swift, and... And she talks a little bit about Martha, and this is where well, I really I got ticked off. I, I, well, I sent her the TikTok, or yeah. I showed you the TikTok with yes. Martha and Snoop. Because I really liked Martha. Martha, yeah. when I was growing up and I had three children, like, you know, mm-hmm. in less than four years, that was like my relief on Saturday morning TV. No wonder my daughter Sarah's a foodie, because she and I would sit there and watch Martha. I can remember yeah. her saying, Mommy, Martha's cooking asparagus! <laughs> like, no, you know, so... And then suddenly Martha is not mentioned in the book, and you were the one that told me that I don't think... Like, when well, Martha went to jail... Yeah, she dropped, Ina dropped her, her as a friend. She, and um, then, then Snoop said... Um, that's when Snoop stood up and goes, now you know where you know who your true friends are. That's right. <laughs> I like and Snoop, too. Yeah, I do, too. So anyway, oh boy. My, my review of this book, I, I think I gave it a 3. Goodreads gave it a 4.51 with over 9,000 ratings. So maybe I'm biased. Maybe it's just me. Well, uh, or, or you have to look at maybe the people that read are reading it are, you know, maybe well-to-do. Or hoity-toity. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So anyway, my next memoir, which I finished in like a day, (laughs) is called What in the World by Leanne Morgan. I can't wait to read that one. This one was published September 24th. Also has the same rating on Goodreads, 4.51, but only 16, like almost 1,700 ratings. I gave it a five because to me, this woman was real you know genuine yeah leanne morgan is a comedian actress writer producer wife mother and grandma her first netflix special i'm every woman was one of the most watched specials on netflix in 2023 um she's been named to the forbes 50 over 50 list and variety's 10 comics to watch list when she's not on the road, she lives in Knoxville still with her husband, three children, two grandbabies, and a beagle. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
So I love this book. I discovered Leanne, like most people, via her Facebook videos and made plans to see her with a bunch of my college friends. Canceled. Thank you, COVID. Mm -hmm. But reading this memoir has made me really appreciate her more. She grew up in Middle Tennessee. Her father had a small grocery store and then a meat processing shop right in their backyard. She used to love to, like, entertain the people that came in. And she also talked about, like, when they saw cars at the funeral home, they'd all go down because everybody wanted to see who died and socialize. And I tell you, you haven't had good food till you've been to a southern funeral. But anyway, her, her life was not charmed, you know. Um, she was also very tall. Mm -hmm. blonde kind of felt like she didn't fit in um her sister was really thin and beautiful she was not she went off to college said quite frankly that she was not prepared coming from the small town she didn't yeah. have the academics didn't do that well she met up with a, a a young man she got married early really bad relationship ended up getting like a divorce at 22 and having to restart her life, she started working again. And then her dad actually talked her into going back to school, even though at this point she's maybe 26. Mm -hmm. You know, that's older than most college students. Mm -hmm. So she did go back and she had a bunch of jobs. And one of them, I think she worked at a restaurant and this is where she meets her current husband. She finished school, um, had children right away. She was always trying to fit like that typical Southern mom role, but yet she had that dream in the mm -hmm. back of her head. She liked making people laugh. Mm -hmm. She liked being funny. She liked being social. And she would fit it into different aspects of her life. She started selling like probably a pyramid scheme jewelry. And people started booking her and booking her, not because of the jewelry, because but because she was so funny oh, and she yeah. would talk about her life. Mm -hmm. And then other people started asking her, well, hey, you know, will you do this thing at the Lions Club or, you know, oh, yeah. for the That's town? And she started expanding. Then her husband's business started taking, he sold like mobile homes or something. Then he had to move to like Arizona or El Paso, Texas. When she got to Texas, Austin, I think, is a big comedy like yeah. capital. Yeah, it is. So right she now. would like get the kids to bed. He would agree to watch them, and she would go and do these oh, that's, like that's really ten cool. minute intervals and started trying to hone mm -hmm. her craft. She never gave up. Like there were periods yeah. of time where she really couldn't do anything, um, but she never gave up. So finally, really when her brave. kids go off to college, she hires these two young guys. She's like, I'm. I'm just going to give it one last try. And they started putting like clips of her material onto the internet. Mm -hmm. So she's moving her daughter into New York City for her job. And then she's watching her social media go from like 200 likes, 2,000 likes, 15,000 likes, 100,000 likes. Wow. You know, these clips yeah. like launched her. So it just. Um, I don't know. It was just so inspiring. And she's also very real. You are laughing hysterically at some of the things she is saying about her husband and her kids and the dogs. And Do you know about her podcast? No. Oh. She has a podcast. This is funny. Oh, my God. It's oh. called Sweaty and Pissed. Com Comedian Leanne Morgan and nurse practitioner Karen Nickel discuss the realities of menopause and the female midlife in a way that is both <laughs> oh informative and funny. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Sweaty and pissed. Oh, I'm the minute I get we get off this podcast, <laughs> right, yeah, I'm we're, we're, that yeah, podcast. We're gonna go put our headphones oh, on. Man. That sounds it's been great. Out for two years. Now, okay, so. that's right up my alley. Well, she also during the pandemic would do like just videos from her home, no makeup, yeah, no nothing. You know, dogs. Her mom had a stroke, so she cares for her too. Um, but I mean, like talking recipes of Jello salad. I can already tell I'm gonna love her. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, just. I just know like I'm someone love her. you would meet in her neighborhood, yeah. and some of the things that happened to her, like she had a friend ghost her once, or you know maybe was attracted to where her husband was going in the business, but then when the recession came, kind of dropped. Mm -hmm. And she talks about things I think that people can relate to. Yeah, you know, like you've had happen to you too. Mm -hmm. um, unlike someone mm -hmm. else I know, yeah. I know garden. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't yeah, know. Yeah, not relatable. No one's Sorry, calling I me know. to write policy for the nuclear budget. Yeah. 
And <laughs> so anyway, I, I um I really like this one. Yeah, I think it's I'm, probably going to be. I think I'm going to love it too. On my list of one of my favorite ones for the year. So. So oh, what is great. your memoir well, that you read? I this is something I would never have read, and I didn't even read it. I listened to it. Now I never say never. I said I never like to look listen to books, um, but this I, I've discovered that I really enjoy autobiographies, biographies, memoirs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, listening to them, especially if they're read by the person who right. they're talking about, and it, it's like having somebody a friendly person telling you their life story, and I loved it. So I got this book for my dad to read. It's Being Henry, The Fonz and Beyond by Henry, Henry Winkler. I mean, I was in love with the... Who wasn't in love with the Fonz? I mean, he came out in 74, um, you know, and I was always watching Happy Days. It was our, It was my show. And yeah, my dad loved, loved it. He show. said, you have to read this, Lisa. You'll really like this book. So I said, oh, all right. And then I started the one that I had gotten that I decided I didn't like. And I thought, I'm going to listen to this. So I did. And I'm like, wow, this is great. And it was given a 4.14 um, rating. And it was just great to hear all these little anecdotes and stories. And he, his wife comes in and reads sometimes, you know, talks. And it was it was just really nice. And it was great to hear all the stories behind happy days and all the things that happened to him, how he became who he was, because he had parents that were, um, that fled from Nazi Germany. In 1939, his dad had the wherewithal to know that he needed to get out. Wow. So he, and and this, what he did was, it was really unbelievable. He told his, he actually lied to his wife. His wife would never leave her family. So I can't imagine how hard this had to have been for him to do this. But he told his wife that they were just going to the to, to America to look at a new business because he was a lumber guy, and that's why they were going. And he and he couldn't get anyone else to to listen to him to say to get out. So he took all his wife's jewelry and had her jewelry made into chocolates and put it in a box. So when he when he went through customs or whatever they had to go through to get to the U.S., they asked him what's in the box because they went through everything that they had to make sure they weren't smuggling anything oh it's just a box of chocolates i'm bringing to give to the man i'm meeting because i'm going over there to look for a new business and they believed him and that's what and his wife really thought they were just going over there to to look at a business can you imagine oh and And they just never went home. they never went home and everyone in their family was killed by the nazis oh my gosh and his wife never let forgave him for doing that to him for her to her you know but i mean she, he, he saved her but in, but her whole family was gone um so she kind of like held on to that their whole life so henry winkler grew up with these people that were very they weren't loving to him they want they were and he was severely dyslexic he he couldn't read and he he did terrible he, you know he didn't do well in school his fam his, he, he didn't want to take over his dad's business they were they were terrible to him. They really were. They weren't nice to him until he became famous. Then all of a sudden they wanted to be around him. But Henry Winkler never let that staunch his his joy for life. He loved to entertain people. Even as a young boy, he would go around and he would entertain people. He actually talked his sister into taking him to watch a taping of the Jackie Gleason, the Honeymooners, mm-hmm. and he charmed his way into the set to watch it. Like, he literally talked to the guard and said, oh, I don't have the tickets, and he made up this whole story, and then he did a song and dance routine, and the guy let him in. So he, that's the kind of person he was. He wasn't, a tr- you know, the typical attractive Hollywood guy. Right. So for him to make it into the business was kind of like, you know, a miracle. So his um, he, he, he did some plays. He did go to theater classes. He went to some a couple of theater schools, and he did he he stuck with it. He did plays. He only was in a couple of plays in school. He was only cast in a couple of them. He loved Shakespeare, which is also was a surprising thing to learn about him. He also wrote a children's um, he, series. Yep, he did yeah, write Hank, a children's Hank series. Zipser, he I was, think because later on in his life. Um, his wife became active with children's causes, and a, somebody approached him and said, "You know, you should you should write a children's series, and you should talk about your struggles with um, having 
having dyslexia. And every time he was given a, he, he, he couldn't read a scripts. He had to kind of, a lot of it, he had to wing it or he had to pretend, which was mind boggling how he was able to do that. I mean, Happy Days was on, it started January 15th in 1974 and ran for 11 seasons. Wow. Um, and he was really close to all the actors. He was clo- um, but especially Ron Howard, they were really close. Now, Fonzie's character took off, and he started getting special treatment and extra pay and special gifts, and it caused a little bit of stress between him and the other guys. But they didn't take it; they didn't hold it against him. They just held uh, Ron Howard held it against, you know, the, whoever the power the exec- was to be, the executives. Yeah. But um, so, and then he, after Happy Days, he was like, "What am I going to do now?" He was typecast. He was so popular. Um, he was popular. Everyone in the world, all over the world, adored him. Um, that, and they also did. He met. He um, what was I going to say? They went on this baseball. Do you remember they had like the Happy Days baseball team? I don't remember. They had a Happy Days baseball team. Actually, he was really good at baseball, and they did a whole tour around the country with the baseball team. It was like a promotional thing. And at one place, they were so swamped by all these girls, they couldn't get to the bus. So he had to go into his Fonzie character, and he was like, hey, come on. you know. And he used his Fonzie character to be able to part the seas, like he parted the seas to get to the bus using his Fonzie character. I'm on a website um, dedicated to it right now. He also... I, another thing that surprised me about him is he really enjoyed smoking marijuana. He smoked a lot of marijuana. And um, one day he was in his apartment and his, when he was starting to become really popular with Fonzie, and there was a knock on his door, and he's like, "Oh no, what's going on?" You know, and he was he he was really high, and there was his whole apartment was filled with smoke. And when he entered the door, it was a group of police officers that just wanted to meet the Fonz. They found out where he lived, so he's like, "Oh my God, oh my God!" So he took all these photos with them, and then he was afterwards. He thought for sure they were going to arrest him and take him to jail because of that, but they obviously they didn't. His his parents were crazy. I don't know how he survived them because when he was famous, his mother would give out his phone number and his address to anybody that wanted it. Oh, no. She, they were nuts. They were like, they used his fame to, to try to get, you know, any recognition for themselves or any special treatments. It was, wow. it was crazy. Um, so his first direct, he directed a lot of different things too as well. He directed Dolly Parton's A Smoky Mountain Christmas. That was his first direct direct debut as a director let's say it that way um that was in 1986 um and then he got a call to do another movie he was called to direct turner and hooch the you remember turner and hooch Mm -hmm. with tom hanks and the dog and everything and he loved it he was right in the middle of it and then the director they fired him oh disney said we don't want you anymore so basically he was canned from that one but he had started it um so eight and there was a, there's a lot of little stories that came out eight seasons into happy days there was a phone near the stage a public pay phone and the phone would ring sometimes and it would be things for him and one day the phone rang and they said you got to take this call and it was a police officer in Missouri and there was a 17 year old who was on the on the ledge who was going to jump and he would only talk, the only person he wanted to talk to was Fonzie. Oh, wow. So he said, well, he got on the phone. He's like, well, what am I going to say? My God, can you imagine? So he got on the phone and he said, first thing I just thought to say to him was, well, why are you on the ledge? And the kid said, well, I want to be an actor and I can't get any jobs. And, and he said to him, do you realize that I didn't get my first acting job till I was 28 years old? And the kids got really quiet. And then he didn't hear anything, and he thought, oh, my God, he jumped. But he didn't. He talked him off the ledge. Oh, good. He was able to talk this kid off the ledge. Then he, the other funny thing was he, he direct well, not funny, but it was interesting, was he directed Cop and a Half with Burt Reynolds. Mm. Burt Reynolds is a jerk. <laughs> you know that? All right, have you ever seen the <laughs> SNL, um, the Jeopardy skits yeah. with Burt Reynolds as one of the, and he's got the big hat on, and he's acting like a goofball? 
Do you never? Do you ever see those Jeopardy skits on SNL? Celebrity yeah. Jeopardy. Celebrity Jeopardy. You've got to go look. Okay. At, they're hilarious. Norm Macdonald plays. Yes. Them. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Now, after he- listening to um, Henry Winkler talk about Burt Reynolds, that's exactly how he acts and acted in real life. Because he said to Henry Winkler, "You're not going to direct me. Nobody directs me, and especially not you." And so he said. Well, then he gave in and said, all right, I'll take a couple of directions, but you have to talk to me a certain way. Because if you don't talk to me the way that I want to be talked to, and he would throw things at him, like a can of soda and things like that. He was nuts. And then he said, and I'm going to direct the kid. Like he was taking charge. I'm directing the kid. Because the little kid that he, he acted with. So Henry Winkler would say to him, um, yeah, Bert, would you, would you have the boy do this and this and that? And Burt Reynolds would stop and think about it, and he'd get angry for a minute, and he'd say, okay, and he'd turn to the boy and go, do this, this, and that. That's how he directed him. He was crazy. And then he and Lonnie and he was married to Lonnie Anderson, and he invited Henry Winkler to his house for lunch, and he thought he was going to his house for lunch as a guest. He had him over there to babysit hit their son. He, they served him. This, he, he, he sat in the kitchen. They served the son his lunch, which was crustless tuna fish sandwiches. They gave Henry Winkler his crustless tuna fish sandwich. They weren't anywhere around him. And then all of a sudden, Lonnie Anderson came in and asked him if she wanted to, he wanted to go see her collection of um, Disney porcelain characters. She had a whole room that was filled with hundreds of these Disney porcelain characters. Isn't That's that so weird. Yeah, pretty much. Very strange. So, anyways, he, he had a very interesting, a lot of fun stories. It's very entertaining. I mean, and then another thing he was talking about was his aunt. When she fled um, Germany, one of the things she brought with her, which I thought, oh, my God, of all things to bring with you, she was her beloved spider plant. So, you know how spider plants give off mine. the little babies? Yeah. So everybody in the whole family, to this day, has a spider plant that came from this original spider plant when the ant oh, fled cool. Germany. Yeah. They all have one. Wow. Isn't that kind of wild? It is. I know. It's it's a really, really good... Um, I really enjoyed it. You memoir. ought to do um, Rob Lowe's stories, I tell my friends. All right. I will do that, too, because I like one's, Rob Lowe. That one is really good. But, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It kind of goes through it. all those 90s movies or late 80s or whenever like St. Emil's Fire and all that stuff. And we're going to go back to Ina because Henry Winkler's nothing like Ina. Okay. <laughs> he yeah. came from I mean, you know, he just he's and, he, and, and after everything he went through with his parents and and struggling with dyslexia, he's just the nicest most down-to-earth guy. Yeah. He really is. He's just a nice human being. And I really liked him. I'm starting to feel a little bit of guilt now about my review of Ina's and book. He's, no, and he's, st- and he's still married to his wife. They've been married for 47 years. And um, they have a really, you know, good, great relationship. And I loved when she got on a few times to tell some stories about Henry. Because she struggled, you know, he went through a lot of struggles with the fame sometimes. And right. And he would sometimes act like a jerk. But... All right. Anyways. Well, thank you for joining us, Lisa. We just have one more episode in November before we name our favorite books of 2024. Wow. And Molly, Sean, and I will be listing that. And our next episode will be Mother-Daughter Reading Update. And as always, the links to the book we talked about will be in our show notes. So thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.